It's good to meet you. Good to meet you as well. It's very interesting to learn about uh, IoT, how it develops and what does the software development have to do with IoT. And maybe you can tell a little bit about what you have been doing and mm -hmm. what is your role as in Canonical. Yes, so I'm a VP of IoT and basically we have been looking at like devices like this, the Raspberry Pi, uh, 2015, you could buy them for like $35, you had to like buy some dongles and, and things, so at the end it was $50. Yes. And people were trying to put software on there and it was hard, so we made an operating system that is based on our Ubuntu that everybody uses in the cloud to now put apps on here and run your own app store. Because uh, what we saw was that like with more slow, this would become smaller. So this was 2015. Yeah. And this was 2016. So this is definitely smaller, much smaller. Basically like you can fit two or three in the same Raspberry Pi, but the amazing thing is like this was $35 plus all the extras around like $50. You know how much this is? $9. And basically it has all the storage and all the adapters except for one that you have here. So basically in one year time everything became half. So our prediction is that like 2017 will bring it to this size and it will be closer to $5 and 2018 2019 it will be this size and it will be $1 now that is hardware what's the software going to do yes because with this supercomputer at this size at this price it will be cheaper to include that in your hair dryer and your toothbrush than to make any custom electronics so you'll have a yesteryear supercomputer in your hair dryer and everywhere around you. So now we have to deploy software in a completely new way. We need to interact with customers in a completely new way. Because before we could sell something for hundreds of dollars, now yes. we're selling it for one. And that's where we've been working on. It's predicted by Gartner that by 2020 we'll have almost 3 billion devices worldwide Mm -hmm. uh, IoT devices. Do you believe it will bring a new complexity in terms of our uh, relationship, our businesses? How is it going to work? How are we going to manage those 3 billion uh, devices in the future? Well, we already have problems with the 1 billion broadband modems there are today. Because if you have these things connected in your home and you make one error somewhere, then viruses can come in. And we saw that the other day in Germany where a virus took over thousands of broadband modems and brought down the internet in Germany for a day. So that thing is already happening. Uh, so security is a big issue. Managing billions of those is another issue. And how are you going to make money? And it's exactly there where we're proposing a solution and it's open source. So basically having the hardware is not enough. You have to have a special software which would be running on those small devices. And this software is, has to be secure, has to be capable of withstanding the attacks that we probably are not even aware of at the moment. Yes, so we made an operating system that focuses first of all on security, yes. secondly on easily managing large deployments. Yeah and making it easy to update and if something goes wrong to roll back and the last thing which is the most exciting one is to run your own app store so not like we know today where like only there's two big app stores that matter one yes. for apple and one for google the idea is that starting 2017 you'll be able to run your own app store so you'll be able to have an app store for um any device, like I'm looking around, there's a projector here in the room, there's a Wi-Fi access point, yes. there's a speaker. Any of those could have their own app store and you could redefine uh, what is sold on there. So how is it going to work from the practical perspective? Can you take us through the stages of how this app store is going to function? Yes, so you will have two extreme app stores. One will be a device that's low cost that everybody can have in their house. Yes. 
and it will be completely open. Any app that gets uploaded is available in an app store and just like now you can browse and buy and the good ones will bubble up. And then you have the complete opposite. You can have app stores on MRI scanners, on mobile base stations, on critical machinery, on trains, on elevators, and those will be a little less uh, numerous, like it will be a couple of apps you can choose from, but you could have a $1 million app for a plane, for instance. So the future will all be about how are all those things going to work together? And this is where we see blockchain as a really big enabler and things like smart contracts. And we've already seen that with smart contracts, you could like automate, for instance, selling or renting your house. Yes. But the future will be freshness uh, or coolness as a service. Yeah. And coolness as a, as a service, you know today as a fridge. But tomorrow you just like pay for your food to be cool every hour and the hour it's not, the manufacturer will automatically pay you a thousand times what you pay an hour back as uh, compensation for your food going bad. So, you'll so in this business model you can see not only maybe manufacturers but also energy providers working together with them and serving the needs of the future consumers. Yes, you don't have to buy a fridge, you pay for the service and that includes the energy. So what will happen in that model, you will have fridges that are made to be durable and consume less energy. And not like now where a fridge is made to, to break after 10 years because they want to sell a new model. Yes, a very interesting concept. But what about security? Even now we have problems with the um, internet cameras. We, we know that those cameras get hacked yeah. yes. every now and then. Children being watched online. What it will, what will happen in the future? How you will be able to secure that many devices worldwide? So we're looking into blockchain also as a way to help us secure things. Yeah. Help us find the bad cameras, the bad actors, the things that have been taken over by a botnet and are doing a distributed denial of service yeah. attack and tell the others about it so that other elements in the network can go and say like, oh, you're bad, let's not talk to you or let's like not allow you to flood anything else uh, because everybody says you're bad. We haven't solved it all yet because we don't want to uh, block good devices by Absolutely. bad devices. Yes. So, so there's still some work to be done, but like where we currently are is we can run software that is hostile to other apps and the operating system in a secure way. Yes. And we're now looking into like, how can we avoid botnets from spreading and, and all these other things. Do you believe that blockchain will have and will play a crucial role in protecting those um, thousands and millions of devices worldwide? And if yes, what kind of role do you see blockchain? Well, in? security will be one. Like you, you have a distributed ledger, or uh, so you know what is good, what is bad. But actually, you see it bigger for like enabling new type of um, markets. So imagine, and I don't know if you're familiar with Industry 4.0. Yes. Yeah. It's all about automating the industrial Internet of Things, all machinery around us. So what most people are looking into is predictive maintenance. If I can predict that a big wind turbine is going to break in the next week and a half and I can fix it before it breaks, I can save millions both from like an engine replacement 15, 20 meters up as well as like a week or two weeks of outage and, and loss of energy. Where can blockchain in the next five to 10 years be important there? Well, imagine now that like, you know that a certain bolt is breaking, but it takes you like three weeks to get a replacement from the other side of the world where the factory is. Yes. Well, smart contracts could now buy the right for that specific element, find industrial 3D printers that are closed, negotiate it to be printed, talk to uh, an industrial self-driven Uber type of logistics to go and pick it up and bring it to uh, the windmill and then have also like a dynamic market of um, experts in uh, maintaining those windmills 
to all be booked at a day in this week and a half that they still have before it breaks, that there's no wind or the least wind possible predicted, and substitute things at the lowest cost possible with the lowest impact uh, possible, ideally when there's no wind and as such, have it all automated. So that is something that blockchain could do and it would save millions uh, to um, industries all around the world. So very interesting. Um, so when we talked about hardware infrastructure, it's clear that there will be a need for a new software developments which would become part of this global infrastructure as well. Maybe you can tell us what role Canonical um, sees in the future of this global infrastructure and uh, how are you planning to get there? Yes, so we are a layer that sits between the hardware and the software. So we're the operating system, but by putting something in the middle, you can now have the software run faster. At this moment, a lot of these things are sold all together. So if there's a problem in a low level thing, then you have a security issue. If like the software isn't that great, you can't update it. Yes. So if we separate it, we could even go to a world where like the design for this could be open sourced on GitHub. You could have open source hardware. So th imagine this as a robot. If you now would have like something that says forward, backward, left and right, optionally up and down. With that abstraction layer, even a nine-year-old could make a robot move and make an app that makes it like fight better against a neighbor's robot. That's the value that people see, the robot fighting type of toy thing. They don't see the value in the algorithm that makes the, the axis move or the wheels go forward and backwards. So at the end, Anybody that now makes an ecosystem of all these pizza delivering robots, slipper delivering robots, toy attacking uh, one another robots and so on, and makes this abstraction layer, they can get a revenue share from all these app developers and get from whoever took the open source design to make the robot a royalty. So the future is all about whoever comes up with abstraction layers from everything from lawnmowers, vacuum cleaning robots, machinery, radios, anything is up for grabs. It's like just the day before the iPhone came in the world, counter is back to zero. And interestingly, you just talked about iPhone and iPhone and Apple is a closed system. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they've been quite successful doing in what they've been doing so far. So what do you believe in terms of the future? Is it the closed system that would um, be more important in certain areas such as IoT or is it mostly the open systems that will proliferate in the future? Yeah, only open systems will win. And the reason is IoT, you can't make all appliances for your home or your business become apples overnight. And that's the problem. You have different uh, speaker systems, different Wi-Fi's, different televisions, different dishwashers. All these things come from different suppliers. If they're all closed, it's impossible that they all start talking to one another. So we need an open system and that's why we open sourced uh, solutions for people to make apps. We call them snaps and we made tools for creating apps called Snapcraft. Yeah. And as such, if you want to connect this to a cloud, it's an app. If you want to support the dishwasher, it's another app. It's all an app. Any protocol, any standard, any integration, any analytics, any blockchain, it's all an app. Very interesting. So when we talk about devices and what they mean in the future for consumers, it will be mostly the new business models that they will have to learn rather than knowing technology which is behind or knowing about blockchain. Do you believe that end consumers really have to be educated about what blockchain is and what it does? No. Uh, if, if people need to know how blockchain works, how a robot internally works, how deep learning works, then uh, that company will not be successful. What consumers and other enterprise customers need to know is it solves my problem. And it solves my problem in the easiest way possible. You don't realize that when you upload your photo to Facebook, 
with this deep learning algorithms looking to see if they can recognize you and all the friends of that picture. It just happens. The same with IoT, the same with blockchain. It just needs to happen, otherwise grandmothers and fathers will not be able to use it and we'll not get to those billions of devices that are sold everywhere in the world and used by everybody. In order for this adoption to happen at the consumer level, I believe that many companies have to change their business models. They have to learn about new possibilities that IoT and blockchain technologies bring. So how can you see this learning process for the companies and then for the end consumers? Is it going to be an easy task? Uh, no. Basically, companies were used to selling this. Then they found out like it was $35. In two years time, it's $1. Well, if your whole business is around selling boxes, it might mean that like you have 150 times less profit now in two years time. So you need to completely change the way you do things. And there you'll see that like traditional companies will suffer. Now there's two approaches that any technologist can take. You can basically say, oh, I have this secret weapon and I'm going to use it to destroy these big corporations because they can't follow. That is disruptive innovation. Uh, we've seen a lot of those, but my proposed model is something else. It's called constructive innovation. It's basically, well, wait a minute. If you look at, and let's say, Coca-Cola vending machines as an example, you could make a blockchain Coca-Cola vending machine that's more innovative than, uh, or a Coca-Cola competing blockchain enabled vending machine that's more innovative than the Coca-Cola machine. What will this bring? Well, you might be able to disrupt a little bit, but it's unlikely that you can get in two years time your vending machine into places like Nigeria um, in Africa. Now, if you think a little bit differently, if you think constructive, how could I make Coca-Cola some extra millions and make myself as well? Well, with an app store on a vending machine, I could do things like, look, Coca-Cola has already thousands of vending machines in Nigeria that are accepting Nairas. That might be a problem for them because every week somebody has to go get the Nairas out, transport them to Lagos, exchange them for dollars, transfer them to Atlanta. That might not be very profitable. So the best thing to do there is to put an app on that vending machine and say like, what if somebody comes with a mobile phone and exchanges with their wallet uh, bitcoins for Nairas? All of a sudden, what happens there is that Coca-Cola sees a problem going away and all of a sudden gets a commission for exchanging Bitcoins to Nairas and it becomes a revenue. Whoever invents that type of app will have Coca-Cola pushing it to places in the world you've never heard of. So both the innovator as well as the corporation make money. And I think it's that constructive innovation that will create a lot more, more jobs than disruptive innovation where like you're just destroying a corporation that gives work to a million people and yes. substituting it with 50 highly paid jobs in Silicon Valley. So we're talking about um, hardware infrastructure that would be flexible enough to host different software solutions and to be able to adapt to a new generation of a software mm -hmm. quite quickly. Yes, and we already have that in front of us. And this new uh, technology and new developments that are coming, in a way, the software developers are becoming more powerful because there are the people who can build those apps. Do you believe that it will definitely have an impact on our society and the class of the rich people will also shift over the software developers or people like which are dealing with a new type of uh, digital machinery? Look, software is defining everything. It used to be that as a corporation, you would look and say like, that's a winner, that's uh, going to be like the big thing. But if there's one thing that the App Store has told us is that like it's unpredictable what's going to be a winner. I didn't know that like shooting some birds that were kind of angry with a catapult would be such a big hit compared to all the millions of other games. 
I didn't know that chasing Pokemons in the street was going to be such a big hit. Now, do we know that an app on a fridge that tells you there's a Pokemon in the street and you should go, you should go start running out now, is going to be that uh, multi-million dollar app? We don't know. Do you know what the first one million dollar generating app was for the iPhone, by the way? It was an egg cooker. It was just helping people to cook the perfect egg. That one made a million dollars. Afterwards, there were more than 200 other egg cookers that never made any money. And that's this world. In the world where like, whoever is first, whoever is fastest, whoever gets it, gets those millions and billions. So it's all about network effect. If you're the first one and everybody's shooting your angry birds and not the angry dogs, then uh, you get it. And this is exactly the message and to answer directly your question yes there will be new startups that will become as big as facebook and google in the iot and the blockchain space and it will probably be the fastest movers most innovative and that will change um the uh the people on the forbes lists as it has done in the last 15 years we can see that the size of devices is definitely going down. Mm -hmm. Does it also apply to the life cycle of innovation? Do you believe that the innovation cycle is becoming shorter and shorter as well? Yes. We, a couple of years ago, it was fine that like we had a repository where you could get software from. You'd have one command to download it. We would like look at all the software out there, curate it, uh, test it, and, pack, uh, and help package uh, it with the community. But the community has told us like, that's way too slow. Like every day we launch a new version. So this is exactly where like we've now gone to a format, which is the snap format, where like the developer decides how often the snap on this device gets updated. And they could launch every hour a new version if they wanted to. So we see this acceleration, but more than acceleration, is going to be also the complexity of isolated fields coming together. All of a sudden, you'll have a smart contract on an augmented reality goggles that is using deep learning to like uh, look at an IoT device and um, get some information about big data uh, that like it produced over the last year. All these things are coming together. It's all accelerating. It's like whoever gets it and solves people's problems and can scale it, that's uh, going to be the, the winner. When you talked about the myriads of devices, talking to each other and helping consumers uh, live better lives in the future, you also talked about sharing models, new sharing mm -hmm. models and new modes of ownership. Do you believe that IoT, including blockchain technology, will help us to create new sharing models of economy of the future? Yes, it's, it's basically uh, going to change how we make transactions possible, how we uh, have devices uh, do things for us. So one interesting thing is IBM has this open source project called Blue Horizon in which they use a Raspberry Pi, yes. a software defined radio and Ethereum. And basically what they allow to do is you put this up in your home and with the software defined radio you can see if like there's planes flying over, if there's a lot of Wi-Fi uh, noise from your neighbors or even if like you have 4G coverage or not. So at the end, with Ethereum uh, smart contracts, you can now go and buy these things from a distributed cloud of devices and take a decision on like, are, am I going to rent in this area of London or that area of London, where's the best coverage? Mm -hmm. So uh, that means you're not going to have these big mega center clouds. You're going to have all these smart devices on the edge that are completely software defined and are becoming schizophrenic. Hmm. The vending machine can like be a bank, give you some like loan in bitcoins, 
but at the same time can also be a telecom operator that allows you to charge your contract or could help you with a doctor appointment or you could ask it a legal question that the lawyer then will answer. It's all going to be like more fluid and we're going to get these like general purpose devices that afterwards the smart contracts and the apps will de define what we use them for. What is your opinion about the future of networks? Will we see more mesh kind of networks building up or they will still build in the way that they build now? We are working on making mobile base stations open source. Mm -hmm. We're working on making mobile base, base stations embedded in vending machines or in other things. Uh, everybody can have in the future their own mobile base station in their home. Yes. Um, so it's going to be this mix of very small cells, medium cells, very large cells, fiber, everything will be mixed. And we'll need uh, blockchain, we'll need deep learning to actually configure all these things because manually it's already hard to do it with several tens of thousands of base stations in the UK but when the UK will have like 10 million cells yes. it will be impossible for manual uh, intervention to configure all of them it will all yes. be about I need some spectrum let's put a smart contract out I need to like now configure the intensity and, and the beaming and so on let's uh, have some deep learning algorithms decide. But who will be in charge of uh, checking the smart contracts themselves? Because when we have tens of thousands of smart contracts sitting on devices, even though they are open source or maybe some of them have an open code, how do you make sure that they do what they uh, say they do? Well, if you're watching this, I hope you're thinking about a good solution because I'm counting on you to solve that one. Thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. I'm sure that um, everyone enjoyed uh, your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.